Thanks, Rod. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I think uh, we just discussed some of the complications that can happen. I, I know I think someone up here talked about the abdominal bulge um, uh, that happens with lateral. But uh, for me, uh, part of when you're doing lateral or if you do, I'm going to talk about corpectomies is really understanding the lumbar plexus. And when you, uh, uh, Stefan showed some great cases, but, you know, for me, the principles are the same, even though you're doing MIS. Um, I think, you know, you got to make sure that you put the right size cage, you get good anterior column um, stabilization, decompress the cord. Um, so just because you're working through a tube doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to skip all these steps. And I think sometimes with MIS and all this stuff, it still comes down to, um, and, you know, me being a neurosurgeon, you always, you know, it's the fusion, right? So the orthopedic guys are really good at it. Um, but it's the fusion that long term is what counts. It doesn't matter if it's percutaneous through a tube, lateral, you know, if it doesn't fuse, it's not going to, it's not going to hold long term. And so for me, I started doing lateral um, for a long time, since 2006, um, when I was a resident in Virginia, I started doing it there when I came out here. And I actually practice here on this campus. And for me, it was really difficult to get an access surgeon. So I kind of had my own um, ideas and, and, and uh, being isolated here, you know, it was like ever, always revolved around the thoracic surgeon or the general surgeon and the vascular. And, you know, they were never really available. And, and so a lot of these procedures now, you know, initially when we started doing them back in 2006, you had to have an access surgeon. There was no codes. I mean, it was wild. You know, you couldn't get the thoracic guys are like, why are you making this decision? This is crazy. You're going to go in the chest. You know, you're going to go in the abdominal cavity. You're going to hit the bowel. Um, and we've kind of learned. I've had every single complication you can think of. Um, you know, femoral nerve injury. Um, in, in our group, we've seen everything. Um, you know, all the structures you can imagine that are there, you can hit. Aorta, vena cava, kidney. Um, uh, I mean, it's all small bowel, um, colon. We've done it all. Um, and, you know, some things you have to watch for when you're doing these bigger cases like corpectomies. Uh, I think earlier Addison mentioned it. Someone asked Addison a question. You know, the red flags for me are always, it's the skinny older patients, the older ladies. They have no retroperitoneal fat. They're really thin. They've had radiation, and they've had hysterectomies, um, and everything's going to be stuck. Um, and so you kind of, those are the patients that get me a little nervous. You know, um, because there just isn't, there's no, the way you do the procedure is through retroperitoneum. And if there's no abdominal, um, uh, there has to be a cushion there for you to do it. So um, these are just some early cases. Um, I don't believe in lateral plating. Um, we used to do it just because, um, you know, to turn the patient over, I was always nervous about stability. Um, and again, just being here um, in a, we're kind of a standalone uh, neurosurgery group and so to get the access guys to come here on the weekend um, you know traditionally these are kind of the different approaches you can do um, and when you do it you know traditionally we go posterior everyone knows the transpedicular there's all these different ways to access the spine anterior and so the lateral procedure I think is is really great for corpectomies uh, you can um, really get a lot done your your um, uh, I use a microscope when I when I start going posterior, but you can go all the way posterior uh, and get in the canal. We can go over the lab, but I try to find the rib, um, and then once you drill the rib head off, then you find the neural foramen, and you're you're right back there um, in the canal. So you can really decompress, um, and you have you have vision. You know all the companies. Uh, Striker has a great lateral system. The lighting. You know, you just have to um, point the retractor so that you're facing. And usually, you know, if we're in the thoracic spine, it's the opposite of the lumbar spine. So you want to stand on the chest side, look towards the canal. So you adjust things a little bit, um, like the retractor is a different direction. We'll go over it in the lab. But there's a lot of, you know, that, and for me, the principles are the same. 
you know, you're just using a smaller incision. So keep all this in mind. I think um, most of everyone here is probably pretty experienced. But, you know, for me, when I first started doing it, if we were doing transthoracic, I'd go through the, through the chest. Um, now I try to go retropleural, so stay out of the chest. Sometimes you get in the chest, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world, but, you know, try to, I sort of, you try to develop the same, you know, you want to, just like in the lumbar spine, you want to stay retroperitoneal, you want to stay retropleural if you can. Um, the thoracolumbar junction can be a little bit of a, a, a tricky situation with the diaphragm, but again, you can go um, behind the cruise. Um, I haven't, I can't remember the last time I took down the diaphragm with uh, an access surgeon. Um, and, uh, and, you know, minimally invasive surgery, however you want to, even open surgery, you know, it's, you got to get the, the patient position and, and get good x-rays to see what you're doing. So getting good AP lateral x-rays is key. Um, and, uh, uh, and what I've learned through the years is that Instead of, you know, because the techs will switch in and out, you'll get a new radiology tech. So I always try to make the patient like AP on the table and then have the fluoro be zero degrees in either direction. So you're not having to remember, is it 11 degrees, is it 9? And, uh, um, you know, typically, again, this is kind of a degenerative x-ray, but if you've got... You know, you, all the standard, um, whether you're doing open, MIS, um, it's, it's still all holds. So you want to get good x-rays and um, really pay attention to, you know, in the old days, we'd have to count the ribs and get the level. But now I think, you know, with good intraoperative um, techniques, basically, you can mark your incision. This is a patient. You know, I usually, uh, if I'm doing a corpectomy, I will try to land the retractor, um, mid vertebral body uh, and uh, kind of just usually what I'll do is I'll mark out what I think the vertebral body looks like there um, and then go ahead and make my incision. I almost always take a rib. I try not to cut the intercostal nerve. Um, if I can, I'll try to dissect it off, retract it, and pull it out of the way. Um, uh, lower down, you know, you're going to get the same complications as you would abdominal bulge and things like that. So you want to try to preserve as much of the normal anatomy. Uh, having said that, if you're doing corpectomy in the thoracic spine, you still have to get your retractor in. And if you don't take a rib, it's just, it's going to be painful. And if you try to stick your rib in there, you're going to end up cracking a rib anyways. So, um, and uh, you're, you're really relying on fluoroscopy. So make sure, you know, if you're going to get a sharp instrument, you're going to go posterior, you're in the thoracic spine, you better make sure that you're, you know where posterior, where anterior is. Um, and again, these are sharp instruments. You're in the thoracic spine. If you go, if you go really deep, you got vascular structures potentially. And if you're anterior, um, you know you can hit the aorta, segmentals, uh, uh, vena cava. So all those, the the when you get in the chest, all those things become more of an issue. Um, and uh, this is a, just um, uh, uh, just an older construct, but I, you know, you can do lateral plating if you want. Um, I think most guys uh, nowadays do posterior. I think the thoracic spine, obviously, with the with the rib cage, is more stable. You can get away with the lateral construct more. Um, and uh, these are just some cases early on. I kind of started when I initially started doing this. I did sort of the easier levels. So for me. Um, you know, doing L1 or T12, you know, you don't have to worry about the lumbar plexus. Uh, you do have to try to figure out the diaphragm and the relationship of the crews. Um, but the lumbar plexus is the main issue when you're doing lumbar spine. So, you know, these are great cases. Uh, they're kind of hard, you know, L1, L2, you don't want to take a nerve root if you go posterior. Um, it's a little bit more um, involved in terms of the amount of um, bony removal you have to do posteriorly. Uh, and, you know, and here's what it looks like intraoperatively, so you can really kind of localize. And uh, what I do now is basically I do, I just go, I, I put the retractor, um, I make the incision in the middle, but then I do discectomy, discectomy, almost like a cervical corpectomy. 
really clean out the disc. And then, um, so different, you know, there's different instruments you can use. There's box cutters, there's uh, rasps, and then really try to clean out. So you've kind of loosened up the vertebral body. So once you do the corpectomy, it's a lot easier. And so, um, and then finally, once I do this discectomy, I then go ahead and put the retractor down, mid vertebral body. I always look for the segmental artery. It's there. It's mid vertebral body. Um, it's much easier to bipolar it, cut it, isolate it, and get out of the way um, than if you put a cob in there and all of a sudden you get this, you know, huge rush of blood. And uh, you know, um, uh, segmentals, you know, their mid vertebral body usually is kind of so you kind of have to look for it. And um, and uh, I usually kind of go down and look for it again. If you're in the thoracic spine, the lumbar plexus really isn't an issue. Um, you're going to try to get uh, a good lateral x-ray. And for me, a corpectomy, you have to know where posterior is because you want to get in the canal most of the time. Um, and all the companies have, you know, they've got great retractors. Um, and, and what's nice now, I mean, when I started doing this, they really didn't, you kind of had to make your own set with cobs and curettes and pituitaries and no one, now it's all, it's all, it just comes in. And again, once you're in, you want to be able to dial it up so you can, so the retractor has to sit perfectly in, in the sense that you have to go from one disc space to the other. And then this is exactly where the cage is going to go. So if, you're, if your uh, retractor's off, your cage is going to be off. So spend the extra 15 minutes to make sure that retractor is perfect. Because you're not going to be able to, once you get the, once you start trying to get the cage in there, it's going to be hard um, to try to manipulate the retractor in. And I always see, you know, people rush and then they try to do the corpectomy, but the, you look at their x-ray and then you do an AP and lateral and their retractor is like, it's not even, you know, basically it's, it's not even covering the corpectomy site. So you do that and um, I usually... Uh, because this is L1, I'm standing behind the patient, so the paraspinal musculature, you're, you're on the opposite side. If you're thoracic spine, usually we turn it around. And then um, there's an anterior blade you can hook on. And then if you're in the chest, obviously, uh, you can use one of the fans, um, fan blades to try to keep the pleura out of the way. And uh, you're going to use uh, big instruments that are sharp, you got to know how far in you're going, how far back you're going. Um, and I try to basically really take a lot of the bone out. Um, and uh, uh, so you, so I like to shell out the vertebral body and then I go posterior because then you've got, you've got an area where you can pull bone back. What I don't like to do is dive right into the canal because you can't pull anything back. Um, so once I get the bone out, then I bring a microscope in and, and work posteriorly. In fact, we have a microscope today in the lab as well. And this is just a case I wanted to show you. So I always use a uh, C-arm. And you can see here that if I just, if I, if I keep tapping the, and the retractor moves, right? So um, you, can, you can get it locked in pretty good. But once you get the cage in there and you start hammering this thing, the retractor can move a little bit. So this is a good case because it shows you the retractor just moved just a tiny bit. And now the cage is going to go into the vertebral body. And if you don't shoot an x-ray, you'll take off that corner. And then your cage will end up crooked like Stefan's was showing. You know, and I've had, I've, had, I've had a ton of cases like that where, you know, you're like, you do a case. I've had them spit out. Um, uh, you know, if, if you damage the integrity of the end plate, that cage is not going to, um, it's not going to sit in there very well. And it's going to fracture and the cage is going to move around. So I try to avoid this, but early on, um, you know, the companies, uh, the instruments were kind of fidgety, the retractors weren't great. Things have gotten really a lot better. So you kind of want to, even sometimes you'll see, even the retractor moves up because you're just manipulating stuff. And then the, regardless of the company, you know, there's like four different arms. And if it, if it moves just a little bit, let's say if you hit it, 
it'll it'll put the retractor up. So you always got to pay attention and make sure the retractor is in the same position um, as you started. And you can see even there, it's already moved more just from putting the cage in. And I try to leave a little bit of shelf of bone um, because being a neurosurgeon, you always forget that this thing has to fuse, right? So if I take all the bone out, unless it's a tumor, I try to leave a little bit across on the other side so you get some fusion. Um, it's really hard to get bone to grow, grow across all the space. Sometimes I wonder, you know, I've, I've got patients where you don't see one ounce of bone that's grown, but it's the posterior fusion that's kind of holding the whole thing together. Um, and again, you can see just by dialing it up right there, you can see how much you can open the thing up. So it's pretty powerful, but it can also um, break the end plate. So it's really hard to see because the distractors, most of them on the cages are so powerful, you can shear off the, the end plate really um, easily. So, um, and then again, you can see my retractor is already, it's already working its way out. And um, so you kind of have to, when you're doing this, I think, you know, you're doing a lot of fluoro, but you, you lose track of what's going on here. And so um, uh, you kind of have to make sure that that retractor is still in the same position. Um, and, and usually, I've, I've taken this out, but usually I'll leave the, the um, uh, uh, implant in with the, so you can take the cage out and remove it. But I know, based on my initial x-rays, you saw there really isn't that much. The cage isn't going to end up posterior or anterior because there's only so much. And then I always look at my inferior and my uh, uh, superior um, blades, and I use that as a, as a guide. So when I put the cage in, I know, okay, if I put it between this goalpost and this goalpost, I should be okay. Um, so that kind of gives you, but you can see how if your retractor's off, your cage is going to be off as well. And you can do it for, you know, trauma. And once you feel more comfortable doing it, you know, this is a patient, if you're going to do L4, um, you know, this patient ended up having neurologic injury. Um, and, you know, so that lumbar plexus isn't an issue. But you can see all the bone fragments there. And you can see there's some lateral translation. So for me, you know, this is a great case to do lateral because, Patient comes in, you can take them straight to the operating room, decompress the canal, um, and get good fixation and not have to, you know, wait for an access surgeon and, and um, do significant amount of reduction um, and stabilize the patient. Um, and uh, uh, the other thing, too, is that sometimes when you're doing these x-rays, you know, you're, uh, and usually I leave the, the, um, the cage inserter on because you'll see in fact you can see here um, usually it's threaded so once you take it off um, it's hard to get it back on so I try to leave it on if I can sometimes you can take the T handle off so it doesn't get in the way but um, uh, once you take it off in fact I've sheared a couple of these you know trying to put it back on um, and they're hard once you get them in there to try to you know reposition it and, and get it out. Um, so uh, this is a case where I had to try to get it back. Unfortunately, I didn't have any problems, but keep that in mind. And then some of the cages have these little locking mechanisms. So once you, I always, I'm in a rush. I'm like, okay, I'm going to lock it in place. And I haven't shot a final x-ray. So you go through all these steps. So I always get a good AP lateral before, you know, calling it quits and trying to get out of there. Um, and, you know, this is kind of what it looks like when you're doing it. It's, it's not that pretty, but, you know, you're really going off the, the lateral um, x-ray. And, um, uh, you know, you have, obviously, you have drills. You have all these instruments. I tend to use a longer uh, drill. Um, and uh, uh, once, once you've done the, the bony work, then, then try to go posterior. But initially... Uh, when we started doing this, you know, I started, I was always nervous about getting into the canal. And so now what I do is once you take all the vertebral body out, it's so much easier. And then you can find the rib. You can just slowly take your time going back. 
um, rather than trying to go posterior and then, you know, it's bleeding like crazy. You've got uh, the epidural uh, venous plexus and you still have to do the vertebrectomy. So that's kind of um, my my tips and tricks. Stefan. Oh, no, no, all the time. No, in fact, I, I, we get them all the time. Um, and I think... Yeah. Yeah. If I can, I'll try to put a proline stitch just to get something in there. If not, you know, put some, uh, put some uh, Surgicel and then some gel foam. Some people use uh, uh, Durgin, but... Um, I haven't, knock on wood, haven't had anything. I had one patient in the chest where I had, I think in the lumbar spine, it's not much, it's not as much of an issue. I had one patient in the chest where I got a tear um, and then and then there was a fistula between that and the chest and that's a nightmare. And I had to go back in. I ended up eventually, we put a VP shunt in that patient because you have negative thoracic pressure um, and so if you get it in the thoracic spine and you get it in the chest, it's a totally different ball game because you want to try to, um, and, and when I get it in the thoracic spine, I'll put all sorts of stuff just so that there isn't that, so you don't develop a fistula. Um, but I haven't had any issues just kind of packing it off and then, and then trying to get all, as much just to tampon audit. And then those patients just to keep them upright, um, and uh, but that that definitely ha that happens a lot. In fact, I've caused a uh, numerous number of CSF leaks doing it. So that's a good question. Um, and then uh, let's see here. And then so you know in the in the lab today, one thing I would encourage you guys to do is really kind of try to do the thoracolumbar junction if you can, because. Just knowing these relationships, knowing where the crus is, diaphragm, this is the best place to learn is in the lab. Uh, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get this. I, I've spent you know many hours and days up here trying to figure that relationship out. And, and if you're gonna do it, this is a place to do it. And you can see, um, this is actually in the lab. We put a light in there just so you can see. Um, and and uh, you know, there's there's. There's a lot of space in between the diaphragm and the, and where you're working. It's just developing that plane. And normally, what I do is I take a big chunk of the rib, and if you follow the rib down, um, and you're standing opposite side, it'll take you right down to the neural foramen um, and the disc space. So uh, when you're in the lab today, try to you know study this and and go through it, and then at the end. You know, you can you can really take a look at it. Um, and we talked about this before, but you know, in the lumbar spine, everyone it gets tense about the lumbar plexus. But don't forget, uh, this is you know, you got vascular structures, um, and bad stuff can happen. You know, I've had segmentals, you name it, um, pseudoaneurysms, you know, vena cava. Most of the most of the the venous injuries are a lot easier to deal with, um, and you can pack it off and you're fine. The arterial ones tend to be a little bit more of an issue. We've had a couple of patients, you know, they end up getting a stent or they get an angiogram. Um, but you can see the relationship of the segmentals. I thought this was a really good um, visualization. As you can see, as you start up high, the segmentals start kind of mid-vertebral mid body, and as they go down, it kind of moves closer towards the disc space, but it's always kind of in the middle, um, in the thoracic spine. And you can see um, how, you know, even the relationship between the left, and this is just one patient, but it, it does vary. Um, and again, don't uh, keep in mind, you know, the, the vena cava as well. So um, I always get a chest, I always get a CT of, if I'm going to do a, uh, thoracic vertebrectomy, I will actually get a, uh, a chest CT because I want to kind of look at the vascular anatomy. Um, you don't have to. I think 
uh, a standard CT is fine, um, but look at the vessels. People oftentimes don't don't consider that. Uh, most of the time you'll be fine, but occasionally it'll change, especially if you're doing like a deformity and you're going to go and and you can imagine if you're if you're coming from this side and you're doing a somebody who's got a really bad coronal deformity, you know you're off just a little bit. You can get a pretty severe injury and get segmental. You can get all you know vena cava aorta. So these relationships always you know we're always worried about the vertebral body, the dura, and you kind of forget about everything else. Um, so. I think I'm going to wrap it up because we're running behind. And uh, does anybody have any questions? But I just kind of wanted to go over the basics of, of doing corpectomies. Yes? I guess I have two good questions. I, I do a fair amount of this female corpectomy. Mm -hmm. It's only recently I've moved on to doing them on the side, the back approach. And, uh, You've moved away from doing it from the side? No, no. I've just moved on to it. Okay, got it. Yeah. But because of the angle, the angle sure. Place where from, how do you work with that? Yeah. So for that, uh, what I try to do is is uh, is find. It's almost like a like a sheet of. It's like Batson's plexus and the posterior cervical spine. I try to find it and use a pen field, and then and try to coagulate it and then cut it. Um, but it does bleed. It does bleed a lot. Uh, you know there are. Uh, you know, like the thrombin um, s sort of material. A lot of times you just have to pack it off. But I actually will try to find it. And then that's probably why I get so many CSF leaks. But I try to find it and then coagulate it and then go down and cut it. Because it's actually a layer. And if you look at the lumbar spine, they, they um, there's a guy in Alabama that wrote this up a lot. It's Shane Tubbs. But in the lumbar spine, it's it's all anterior. And it's this huge collection, and it, and it bleeds like crazy. So I try to coagulate it with these long bipolars and cut it. I think that helps a little bit, but there's no question it can bleed a lot, especially if you get a CSF leak. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on that one, I think. Uh, you can really go e either way. Um, uh, I think you know whatever. Uh, I think on her, we ended up going on the this the uh, the other side where there wasn't much bone. Um, but uh, you know, I, I don't think there's an advantage to going in on one side or the other. I just, for me, I think I went on the side where there's there's no bone because I was I was trying to get the stuff that was in the canal. Um, and if you looked on the CT, I think there was more bone on the canal on the left side. So that's the side I went on. Rod, do you, um, yeah. you know, like you hear about that Mickey Mouse sign people talk about nowadays when they talk about which, which side you should approach and, and whether or not you should be weary of the plexus, right? Um, so do you take that into account when you're planning on, on doing something, especially down in the maybe like L3, L4 levels? You know, I don't, I mean, I tend to, I used to do everything on the concavity, but now I do it on the convexity because it's so much easier to get to the spine. Um, and for me, I mean, I want to try, I want to know where the nerves are. So if I'm doing L4, 5 or L3 and everything is normal, that kind of makes me tense. I want to know where the nerve is and how far back I can go. Um, but uh, uh, I think the the areas I get nervous obviously is L four five, and uh, and L three four not as much, but those are kind of the two areas. Mm -hmm.